Okay, let's go to our preaching time. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, in the New Testament to the book of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And we're going to begin there with verse 26, down through verse 39. Acts chapter 13, beginning with me at verse 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them, the prophets, in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who were his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, that is, he died, and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he, whom God raised again, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Let me stop right there. Both Christians and uh, non-Christians, believers and non-believers, all have to agree that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the foundation on which all Christianity rests. It's the, the pivotal event in human history. And it certainly was the, the linchpin that holds our faith together. It's the key of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Bible Christianity is the only um, ancient religion in the world who believes its founder is still alive. The so-called Buddha, if he even lived, is uh, said to have died about 500 BC. Muhammad died about 640 AD, the founder of Islam. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon religion, his grave still has his bones in it. Karl Marx, the founder of communism, is dead. The boast and the great joy of Christianity, and the glory of Christianity, is that we believe the one who started our faith is still alive. The, the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ is famous for what it does not contain. You have to think of it in those terms. Um, and Jesus cried, it is finished, on the cross of Calvary. And it's as though God put an exclamation point, or said amen to that, by raising him to life again from the dead, amen. after three days and three nights. And, you know, there's, um, excuse me, I got pages stuck together here. The record and the boast of the book of Acts is that the emphasis of the apostles' earliest preaching 
was on the fact that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. And thus he gave legitimacy and uh, uh, authenticity to everything he had said and preached up to that time. On the day of Pentecost, the first sermon ever preached in the new church by Simon Peter uh, emphasized the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He said, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. Later, Peter and John raise a lame man outside the beautiful gate of the temple in Acts chapter 4. And um, when the crowd of curiosity seekers, onlookers, came to see what was happening to this man, then they preached to this crowd and said, Ye killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Acts 3 verse 15. Peter said, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Acts 4, verse 10. And then Peter um, and the other apostles preached, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Acts chapter 5. Verse 30, the foundation of the earliest preaching of the apostles all emphasized the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. If there was no resurrection, we'd have no Christian faith. We'd have no Christianity to believe in. There would be none. By the way, D. James Kennedy wrote a book years ago called What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And you might clarify that and say, what if Jesus had never risen? But his point was, the birth and the coming of the Lord Jesus into the world, and I guess by association his resurrection from the dead, created Christianity as we know it. My brother's indicating to me I got something on my face. Right here? Okay. Do I look good on the camera? <laughs> Who cares? But had there not been any faith of the Lord Jesus Christ from rising from the dead, there would be no Christianity. Right. And it wouldn't spread across the countries. It wouldn't spread across the continent of Europe as it did. Or into the Middle East or into African continents. It wouldn't have spread anywhere. Because there would be nothing to it. And had it not spread, for example, to the European nations, and Christianity blossomed and took shape, and some Christians felt persecuted because of their belief, they never would have set sail to escape the persecution of the papacy and Catholicism and come to North America where they had freedom to worship as they wanted. Had there been no coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, no resurrection of Jesus Christ, there'd be no United States of America as we know it today. And had there been no United States, you and I wouldn't be here assembled as we are today, yeah. praising the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ's coming into the world, and larger than that, his rising again from the dead set a lot of events in motion, and they're still unfolding in the world even today. And the gospel would not have gone by missionaries and other people around the world. It wouldn't have reached uh, other nations. It wouldn't have reached the Korean Peninsula. It wouldn't have reached Japan. It wouldn't have reached African continents. And none of us would be gathered here together as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ had he not risen from the dead. There's a lot at stake if the Lord Jesus didn't rise from the dead. You know that? There's a lot riding on that. According to the Apostle Paul, if Jesus did not rise from the grave, then we have no lasting hope beyond this life. He wrote, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Acts, or 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If he didn't rise again, he said, our preaching is vain. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. Its point is to believe in it. Its point is to preach it. Its point is to talk about it if it didn't happen. You know, you can believe that the Lord Jesus died for your sake. He suffered for your sins. 
that he was buried in the tomb, and that after three days and nights he came back to life out of the tomb once again. You can believe that all you want to, and it won't do you any good if he didn't rise from the dead. Faith is only faith if it's placed in something that's so, that's really true. And because we believe it is true, it gives us the hope, it gives us the confidence, it, it gives uh, substance to our faith. Uh, Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so because we do have confidence that Christ did rise back to life from the dead, we don't believe in something that's empty and vain and pointless. But if Christ didn't rise from the dead, the Apostle Paul says, ye are yet in your sins. You're still unforgiven by God. You're still on your way to hell. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 17. You're still guilty. You're still unforgiven. You need something to be done. So as Christians, then a lot of, uh, there was a lot at stake for us to show and to be able to demonstrate and argue and have confidence in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Christ rose from the dead in triumphant power after having been buried for three days and nights, then we know that it's possible for someone to rise from the dead. Amen. And our hope in him gives us the confidence that one day we're going to rise from the dead if we should die before the rapture takes place. And that belief won't fit any sort of naturalistic evolutionary theory. Things like that don't happen. It required the power of some sort of supernatural intervention for it to take place. And for it to take, be true. And the scriptures tell us, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15 And the Bible commands us, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Peter 2.15 And it was the Lord Jesus Christ who said himself, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. John 5, verse 39. And so with those um, admonitions in mind, we'll look at some of the scriptures and we'll look at some of the arguments today and take the subject of the resurrection. True or False. The resurrection, true or false? If the resurrection of Christ is true, then we have answers to some of the greatest questions men have ever asked. Where did I come from? Well, if the resurrection is true, we know that God must exist. I mean, how else could you explain his resurrection except by the act of God? And therefore, if God exists, he made you. Why am I here? You know, the Anglican Church, the Westminster Confession, in 1646, had a very good answer to that. They said the chief duty of man is to glorify God and enjoy fellowship with him forever. It's very succinct, right to the point. The chief duty of man is to glorify God and enjoy fellowship with him forever. Where am I going when I die? That depends on your relationship with God by and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5 and verse 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. In fact, every word in that verse is a single syllable. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's as simple as God could have possibly made it. And if you can understand a one-syllable word, you should be able to understand that verse. Wouldn't it be in God's interests to make salvation as easy to receive as possible? So as many as could would receive it? Why would he make it complicated? You have to join this and do this and remember that and act this way and act that way. Wear these certain clothes, cut, have a certain haircut, do all these certain things, and you might get in. People that have a long list of rules and requirements in their denominations end up telling you nobody knows for sure whether they're saved or not. 
they usually end up saying, well, no one can know for sure. We hope we're doing everything right. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. But a Christian believes that all the answers, all the blessings, all the joys of, of claiming to be a Christian and the will of God can all be discerned by studying the scriptures and it all hinges on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ to give it all legitimacy. A famous Christian author named Andrew Murray once wrote, A dead Christ I must do everything for, but a living Christ does everything for me. That was very well put. But consider some of the testimonies we have uh, in favor of the resurrection. First, there's the testimony of the Christian church itself, Christianity. Yeah. According to the most recent World Almanacs, I think there's seven and a half billion people, close to eight billion people in the world now. One third of the entire world, 33.3% of the world's population, identifies itself as some form of Christian. Now I realize that number takes into account a lot of misfits and oddballs, right? <laughs> you got your Mormons and your JWs and your Christadelphians, they're sort of like distant cousins to the JWs, and a bunch of other groups. But the larger point is one third of the world wants to identify itself with Jesus Christ in some way. His public ministry was only three and a half years, hardly long enough to fix itself in the minds of people that they all want to be a part of it. They all want to identify themselves with him in some way. And the only thing that gave that uh, preaching of the Christ, uh, Christ so much authority is his resurrection from the dead. That's what gave him legitimacy. It vindicated everything he said, everything he preached, everything he taught. It established him as the redeemer of the world. Only the Savior can save. People think a lot of other things can do the job. They can't, never can. Unless something so uh, dramatic happened to give new authority to everything Jesus had ever preached, it would have drifted and fallen away. But it was his resurrection from the dead and the apostles' early preaching that this was so. If Jesus Christ um, has not risen to life again, then his death has no more significance than the death of anybody else who might die for a political conviction or some religious conviction. People have done that often over the years. But in three and a half years of public ministry, his rising from the dead made his gospel more powerful than any other message ever preached to the human race. Now that, uh, that's uncommon in history. Coming back from the dead after having predicted it beforehand, saying you would do so, that doesn't happen all the time. Secondly, we have the testimony of the Christian day. The Christian day. There's a few screwballs like Seventh-day Baptists and Seventh-day Adventists who think worshiping only on Saturday every week is what secures their relationship with God. You want to talk to a Seventh-day Adventist one of these times when he says he believes that the worshiping on the seventh day um, is really important uh, that God gave that commandment in the Old Testament and expects all men to follow it. Say, uh, you want to point out something to him. In Genesis chapter 2, the very beginning of the Bible, the Bible says, Thus were the heavens and the earth created in six days, and God rested the seventh day from all the creation which he had made. But there's no commandment for Adam and his descendants to do so. It says God rested on the seventh day from all his creation, but he never gave commandment to anybody else to do so. And in fact, he never gave commandments to anyone to observe the Sabbath day as a day of rest until 2,500 years later when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt in the book of Exodus. 2,500 years of Bible history unfolded. Adam didn't know about it. His son's... Uh, um, uh, Cain and Abel didn't know about it. Seth didn't know about it. Ab um, Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, they, none of them knew anything about it. 
None of the patriarchs knew anything about it. Nobody knew anything about worshiping only on the seventh day and resting on the seventh day until God made specific commands to Moses. 2,500 years of Bible history took place without anyone knowing anything about it. If it's that essential, if it's that important, why did God let a third of the Bible's history timeline unfold without anyone having practiced it? You want to press a Seventh-day Adventist with that one day. But the Christian day. The Bible says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Acts 20, verse 7. He told the church at Corinth, when they would gather together, take up their collections on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16. Verse 2, the day of Pentecost fell upon the first day of a Hebrew week. All you have to do is go back and read the instructions for observing the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, uh, Leviticus 23, verse 16. And uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church is not the church that forced everybody to worship on Sunday. That doesn't constitute the mark of the beast if you worship on Sunday or gather on Sunday. As a matter of fact, there's so much liberty in the New Testament, uh, it doesn't matter what day you gather together. There are no hard and fast rules. You have to worship and set aside this one day of the week. You might have a job where your boss doesn't let you have Sunday off. So there's got to be liberty and flexibility. God, saw, God foresaw all of that. You gather with other believers as often as you can, Hebrews 10.25, and it doesn't tell you exactly what day to gather on. Now, traditionally, because the tomb was found empty on the first day of that next week, and since the disciples began to gather on the first day of every week to remember it, to remind themselves of it. And the day of Pentecost fell on the first day of a week. It wasn't something added and forced on people by the Roman Catholic popes later on. The Catholic Church has come along and tried to claim credit for everything the Bible already told people to do. They're, they're late to the game. Christians were already setting aside the first day of the week as the day that they would remind themselves that they serve a risen Savior, and the rest of the week they set about to live for him. And when you think about it, these were all Jews. Their, sh their shift in focus went from the seventh day now to the first day of each week. It was a tremendous change indeed. What could have made them switch their attention that way, except the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They knew it was true. It was the fact that something so significant had happened on the first day of the week following his crucifixion. It couldn't be denied. And their attention shifted from the seventh day now to the first day of each week to remind themselves of, of their living Savior and who it was they were living for. Thirdly, we have the testimony of the Christian book, and I mean the Bible, specifically the New Testament. The resurrection is mentioned 104 times in the New Testament, directly or indirectly it's alluded to. In the New Testament, we have six different uh, accounts given to us by the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, and Paul. They all refer to it. Uh, in the case of Matthew, Peter, and John, they were all part of the Christ's 12 apostles. They were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. And it's remarkable that throughout the New Testament, none of the New Testament writers ever set about trying to argue and prove and, and convince everybody that Christ had risen from the dead. In their day, it was common knowledge. Everybody knew about it. It was common knowledge by the believers, and it was reluctant knowledge on the part of the Pharisees and the scribes. They didn't want to admit it, but they couldn't hide it. They couldn't deny it. It had happened, and now they're scrambling, looking for some way to explain it away. But Paul preached in our text today, verses 29 through 31, once again. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came with him up from, excuse me, came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who were his witnesses unto the people. We have the testimony of the Christian book. It has stood for the past 
2,000 years without anyone ever being able to disprove it. It was true. Everyone knew it was true. And point number four today, we have the testimony, I would say, of strong answers to weak objections. Strong answers to weak objections. Uh, it's important for us to answer the theories that some people have put forth, trying to explain away the resurrection of Jesus, to get rid of it, try to erase it from human history and act as though it didn't happen and therefore it doesn't affect them whatsoever. We, all, we fully understand that not everybody believes Jesus rose from the dead. Because not everybody is convinced of their own sin and their own guilt. Not everybody wants to be saved. Not everybody thinks they need to be forgiven. They think they can join a denomination, just show up for church once, a while, once in a while, and sort of a social club where they meet their friends and their business associates, uh, but they have no uh, interest in the Lord Jesus Christ at all. They want to do what they want to do, call themselves Christians in some way, in some form, but without any obligation to the Savior himself. This is how multitudes want to live in the world today. Jesus Christ is someone you're going to have to give an account to one day. I'd rather give to account, account to him as a believer who receives, hopefully and prayerfully, some measure of reward at the judgment seat of Christ and stand before him as an unbeliever at the white throne judgment. But first of all, there's the theory that maybe his disciples simply stole his body and claimed that he had risen from the dead. You know, when the guards reported to the chief priests that the body of Christ was gone, the chief priests gave the guards money and told them to tell the story, say that his disciples came while we were asleep and stole the body. There's something wrong with that, however. See, if, if they were sleeping at the time, how do they know who came along? How would they know who stole the body? And if they admitted that they were asleep on the job, they'd be setting themselves up for execution by their authorities. They took the money and they told that tale, but it never gained any traction because it was weak. They took the money and pretended like it was true and claimed it was true, but it wasn't. Excuse me. I had too many interruptions today. That's okay. Uh, there's also the theory that the chief priests and the scribes stole Christ's body, took it, uh, to prevent the disciples from spreading the story that Christ had risen from the dead and venerating his body like uh, Catholics do, some goblet that has supposed flesh and blood in it from mass centuries ago. How many read that article about Jews worshiping the, the dead heart of some rabbi that died about 100 years ago? It was in the news the other day. That, that heart goes around from... Synagogue to synagogue as some relic, some showpiece for devout Jews to worship this great rabbi they think had great wisdom. There's a church over in Poland that has a vial of Pope John Paul II's blood in it. And they see a Catholic church, every Catholic altar is consecrated, according to them, by the presence of some relic. Might be a swatch of clothing, might be a fingernail, might be some part of a Catholic saint. They take that tiny bit and they deposit it inside that altar and seal it up in a little hole. And, uh, of course, there's usually a, a cloth covering the altar. But the presence of those relics is what makes that altar holy and suitable for the Mass to be performed, the changing of the bread and wine. It's a strange fixation on dead things, if you ask me. It's an overemphasis on uh, the dead body or the dead relics or dead objects of some famous person. But if the priest had stolen the body and the disciples began to say that Christ had risen from the dead, all the priests would need to do would then be produce the body. See, Jesus didn't rise from the dead and the preaching would stop. But they didn't produce it. The preaching didn't stop because Jesus had risen from the dead. It would never have grown and spread around the world with the kind of message and the kind of force that it 
than it has uh, if Christ hadn't risen from the dead. He said things like, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you and persecute you. He said, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Well, who wants to pay their taxes? Nobody likes doing that. He said, if you follow me, give up everything in order to follow me. You'll gain treasures in heaven. He said, if you become my followers, it may mean the loss of your family and your loved ones hate you. Well, nobody wants to create friction among their family members. Unless, the power of the one who said those things overrode any inconvenience those things might bring about. And it was his resurrection from the dead. Once he rose from the dead, everything he had commanded prior to that had new force, it had new uh, power, new authority behind it, because he was now alive. Amen. There's a theory that maybe in the dark of the morning hours, the women went to the wrong tomb, and then they reported Christ having risen. Well, that would be easily fixed in the morning. All they had to do was go to the right tomb and see if Christ was still there. So that fell by the wayside. And then there's what they, they used to call the swoon theory. It was the idea that Christ wasn't even dead when they took him off that cross. He had been scourged and beaten and near death, but was only unconscious. And uh, laid in the tomb, and in the dampness and the cold of the tomb, somehow it caused him to rally and revive. How he would be able to move a thousand pound stone away from the tomb uh, in that weakened condition is another mystery indeed. Um, it's hard to believe that if Christ had first been scourged until he was raw and bloody, that he was made to carry the tomb as far as he, or the, the cross up as far as he could to Mount Calvary, then laid on it and have his hands and nails nailed through onto that cross and to be hanged up for at least six hours and eventually have a soldier thrust a spear into his side that he would um, come back to life and be able to rally to strength once again. And this so-called swoon theory only began in the late 1700s by skeptics who didn't want to admit that Christ was alive. In 1840, there was a German writer, a German critic, who doubted the resurrection of Jesus. His name is uh, David Strauss. And he rejected the idea of the resurrection, but he rejected this whole idea of the swoon theory by saying this, it is impossible that one who had just come forth from the grave, half dead, who crept about weak and ill, who stood in need of medical treatment, of bandaging, strengthening, and tender care, and who at last succumbed to suffering, could have ever given the disciples the impression that he was the conqueror over death and the grave, and that he was the prince of life. And yet that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is to us who know him. He's conqueror over the death and the grave. He's the prince of life. He gives new life to the dead soul, the dead spirit that doesn't know God. He regenerates the dead spirit by the power of his Holy Spirit. He makes sure their name is in heaven and uh, their sins are forgiven, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of them, and that uh, they have now 24-hour uh, access to the throne of God by his death and resurrection. There's a man named Simon Greenleaf. He was a royal professor of law at Harvard University in the years 1833 to 1848. And his work have helped uh, establish the legal precedence, uh, the, the forms of questioning and cross-examination used to establish the case in a court of law. His laws of his rules of, of gathering evidences. And when he applied his legal skills to examine the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he concluded that the resurrection was one of the best supported events in all of human history. Could not be denied. At least it was argued so strongly and so forcefully and so powerfully, using legal arguments to do so, all the rules of jurisprudence. There was a British writer named Frank Morrison. He was also a skeptic. 
and he set out to refute the evidence for the resurrection of Christ. And after considering the best testimonies, the best evidences available, legal evidences, excuse me, he ended up defending the resurrection of Christ in a book called Who Moved the Stone? Who Moved the Stone? And I'm going to begin to bring this to a close here. There was another writer named Lou Wallace who also doubted the resurrection, set about to write a book uh, refuting the resurrection of Christ. And the more he studied, the more he examined the evidences and the testimony available for the resurrection of Christ, the historic evidences, the historic testimonies about Christ and his influence on different worlds and different societies. He ended up writing a book in defense of the resurrection, became a very popular movie called Ben-Hur. And as Andrew Murray said, a dead Christ I must do everything for, but a living Christ does everything for me. I'm glad that I know him. Amen. I'm glad that as a little boy I trusted him to save my soul, to cleanse me from my sin, to write my name in heaven, forgive me of my sins. It's a very simple matter between someone who knew he was guilty, even as a kid, and trusting that God wanted to forgive him and made a way to forgive him of his sins through the person and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, when you're a sinner and you know you're a sinner, but at the same time you understand that Christ lived a perfect life without sin, and when he died, he died on your behalf. He was taking the punishment for your sins. A perfect man dying for you, an unperfect man. When you understand that, and you say, God, in the best way I know how, I don't know how else to do it. I don't know how else to approach you except to throw myself on your mercy. I believe Jesus died for me. I'm asking that he would become my savior and that my sins would be covered by his goodness and his righteousness. Then your sins are put upon him, which he already paid for by his death at Calvary. His righteousness is then credited to you, even though you didn't earn it and don't deserve it. And a great transaction takes place between the sinner and and the Savior. That's why I said earlier, only the Savior can save. Your church membership, your church religion, uh, some ordinance or some sacrament, none of those things can affect eternal salvation of the soul. Only the Lord Jesus can. And it can happen that quickly. Amen. How many of you raise your hand today you say, I know that I'm saved. I know I'm a Christian. If there's anyone today and you're not sure if you could raise your hand in all honesty... Listen, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to help you see the scripture, pray and ask God to forgive you of your sins. Write your name in heaven. Make sure you're saved. Make sure when this life is over, if you were to die tonight, you'd know for sure you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ. Uh, there's nothing quite like having that sort of knowledge, that sort of confidence. And I'm glad that I have it.